Okay, so I am Dr. Amanda LeCastro, and I am the Emerging and Digital Literacy Designer here at the University of Pennsylvania. My office is in Van Pelt Library upstairs on the third floor, and really my job is about helping faculty, staff, and students integrate technology into their teaching and learning in really thoughtful and innovative ways. So today I'm going to be talking to you about a few things here. I've got a brief agenda. First, I'm going to talk about what a teaching demo is and why you should prepare for one. I'll also be talking about how technology can support active learning. And I'm going to talk about the very important power of three the backups for your backup plans. And this, that really goes for any research or teaching demonstration that you would be doing as part of an academic job search. I do apologize, my voice is a bit strained this week, but I'm gonna do my best. Might need to take little water breaks, but if you have any trouble hearing me or if I'm going too fast, please do let Diane know in the chat so she can stop me. I will also make these slides accessible to you I'll put the link in the chat at the end during the Q&A so that you have them and you can read um, and refer back to these slides at any time. Okay, so let's start with our first question. What is a teaching demonstration? There are often two kinds of teaching demonstrations that you might be asked to do as part of an academic job search. And this is true both for faculty positions and alternative academic positions. I have given teaching demos for both kinds of positions. I was the assistant professor of English at Stevenson University before joining the University of Pennsylvania libraries um, in an alternative academic position. So I have experience in both. Um, the kind of classic, classic example of a teaching demonstration is what we call the in-class demo. And this is where you're invited to be a guest lecturer in an actual course teaching students who are enrolled in that class. Usually you will be given access to the syllabus, the course site, and any other materials you would need to understand where, at what point in the semester the students are at and what they have been discussing or learning. You may actually be able to assign readings or work with a reading that they're doing in that class or a pre-scheduled assignment in that class. And these kinds of teaching demonstrations often happen in an actual classroom. Although in addition to the students, there will probably be members of the search committee um, and even maybe other members of, of the university or institution. The other type of teaching demo that is common is what we call an open teaching demo. And this is where it would basically be like a mock <laughs> class or it would mimic a classroom, but is in fact just um, simulated as part of the interview process. So here you'd be teaching to a mixed audience. It may include undergraduate and graduate students. It could be postdocs, faculty, and staff, and will often include campus leaders as part of the process. And the audience will have been uniquely invited and have volunteered to attend. So you may often be able to provide instructions or assignments in advance again for this type of teaching demonstration. Often they're expecting you to choose a topic that's related closely to your research, um, whether or not there's a research talk also required of you. Or, and this is really important in terms of your research, you want to research a class that is often or typically taught in that department and target your teaching demo to that course. Sometimes even in job ads, the list, like this position will need to teach these five courses. And you're gonna wanna think about that as you prepare for this kind of open teaching demo, like which course do you imagine this fitting into and why? Sometimes these open teaching demos will not actually be in a classroom, but more in a conference room or a lecture hall of some type. So it's always good to ask. Okay, so how do I know that the teaching demonstration is important? Besides my own personal experience and uh, those of my colleagues and friends and peers in the academy, um, there's data to support that it's highly likely that you would be asked to do a teaching demonstration, no matter what your discipline. 
This statistic is actually from 2013, but it says that 62% of biology departments required a teaching demonstration. And that even though it is dependent on what type of institution, so at community colleges, it's highly, highly likely that you're gonna be doing a teaching demonstration. Other undergraduate focused teaching institutions, your liberal arts colleges, your regional comprehensive colleges, also highly likely, but also, and I really do think that 62% number has gone up in the last decade. You're going to see these increasingly at um, even your prestigious R1s and um, um, highly competitive liberal arts colleges. But I want you to keep in mind that any enrollment driven institution, meaning that the financial model is dependent on getting those undergraduate students in chairs <laughs> and enrolled in those colleges, it is highly, highly likely that you will be doing a teaching demonstration of some kind. So it's great to prepare in advance for that inevitability. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how to use some of those tools that you just said that you're interested in effectively to support active learning. And by active learning, I mean, instead of just listening to a lecture and regurgitating information, right? That instead students are engaged in building, making, and shaping their own knowledge development. That you're creating a community of practice of students who are learning not only from you, but from each other. So typically in the past, when we've talked about educational technology, you get this warning, like, don't let the tool drive the pedagogy, meaning don't have a shiny new toy and then design your assignment around it just because it's shiny and new. Okay, that's a fair warning. However, if we flip that and say, only focus on your pedagogy and then just bring in technology when it seems absolutely necessary, right? That's also flawed because you may be ignoring some of the wonderful tools you have at your disposal. So when you look at these two far right columns, the actual and the aspirational columns, these are what um, is called entangled pedagogy. And again, I have the citation here for you. But entangled pedagogy really means thinking about the tools and the pedagogy at the same time. So they're integrated thoughtfully and so that they're multifaceted and not just like a single use or a unitasker, right, in your pedagogy, but that you're coming to the same tools time and time again because they've proven to be effective for your teaching style and for your student population. So what we're looking for here is that you're thinking about both the learning objectives. So for me, one of my learning objectives is always close reading or deep reading. How do I stimulate good, deep, close reading of a text along with all the possible tools I have at my disposal? So of course I have books, I have eBooks, I have audio books. I have lots of tools that might help my students um, read closely and read deeply. You wanna be thinking about both of these things at once. And you really, and this is, key down here is you really want to think about your you yourself, the instructor, and the, your students as collaborating on any teaching and learning project together as equal partners, not as just you providing information for them, but as them as equal partners in the learning process. What I want to tell you is how, how this might look in practice. So I'm going to give you a concrete example here. Tips. You're focusing on active learning. I'm going to choose an activity that I've done many times before. You don't want to try something you've never done before in a teaching demonstration. I want to ask in advance about any specific classroom and technology affordances that are already in place. Okay, so do they have a learning management system? Do they have a projector in the classroom? How many students are there? What is the desk set up? Is it a seminar room or a lecture hall? Do they have group tables? I want to ask um, to see, you know, if there's space to move around to do group work. I'm going to ask if there's laptops in the classroom, all of that kind of thing in advance. I also want to prioritize accessibility. So circulating your materials in advance. If you're using videos, making sure they're captioned. If you're using images, making sure there's alt text. Asking about any accommodations in the class so that you can make sure that you're doing things like providing high contrast for those who are colorblind or 
um, sans serif for those who have dyslexia, et cetera. You really wanna think about accessibility in advance and you're gonna time yourself with an audience multiple times to make sure you fit in your time frame. And I'll get back to seven and eight, but you really need to have a backup plan in case all fails, it's Murphy's Law. So here's my example. For me, for an effective teaching demonstration, I am very comfortable with social annotation software. These are platforms that let students annotate a text together online. Why is this great? Because I can select a short text, either based on something that I wanna teach the students or that's already part of their course that I'm walking into. I can use a variety of tools. I can inquire to see if the institution already has perusal, which we do at the University of Pennsylvania, or Hypothesis, which is integrated into many course management systems. And if they have neither, I can set up my own site without access to the course management system to distribute via email. So very flexible tool. Why, why does this work for me? Because it asks students to annotate a text in advance so that I can see what those students are thinking about before I get to my teaching demonstration. I can give them very specific instructions on what I want them to do to generate material I can use. And I can also give them time at the beginning of my teaching demo to annotate if they didn't do the homework, which you will find at community colleges and many other places, students haven't done the homework. So you wanna build in time for them to do that right in your teaching demonstration. It also gives you a chance to catch your breath, which is great. I can provide paper copies as a backup and collect annotations on note cards. And this is really key, and I'm gonna show you this in a minute. It allows me to integrate the student comments into my lecture slides. So I'm making students the focus of my teaching demonstration. And I can follow with a very low tech analog think pair share or another student led activity. This is what this looks like in practice, right? I distribute the reading in advance. Some students will annotate it as they're supposed to before class begins. Some will do it right there at the beginning of class when I give them some time. I'm giving them very specific instructions on how to annotate, not assuming that they know how, but ask for summaries, definitions, references, opinions, questions, and links to other materials so I know what's happening in their brain and what the students find interesting about the reading I've provided. I then am gonna take a screenshot of some of the best comments pull them into the slides that I'm giving in my teaching demonstration and connecting it to further information that I'm an expert on, really showcasing my research and my expertise as support for their opinions and their um, expertise that they brought into the comments. So again, that mutual knowledge building. How does this work to go back to that entangled pedagogy, right? I'm using technology as a multiple contextual and relational tool, right? The context here is that I want students to do a close reading. I need students to provide their insights, even though I don't know them well and they don't know me. We haven't built any trust yet, but I need them to be active participants. So I'm using the tool to build that asynchronously. And it's allowing us to collaborate together to flip that novice expert binary and really showcase what the students bring, their perspective, so that it's not just focused on me as the instructor. It also allows us to distribute the knowledge in a really ethical way where I'm not calling on people or putting them on the spot, but rather showcasing their work in a way that doesn't make them feel uncomfortable. Okay backup plan. My first um, line of defense was I'm going to try to use Perusal, which is already integrated in their course management system. That doesn't work. I've got a public hypothesis link. Great. Same exact process, different tool that allows me to do it without an LMS. Last line of defense, good old paper and pencil annotations, which I can distribute right there in class and, and collect. This is, gives me lots of options to make sure that no matter what the situation is when I walk in that day, I can effectively execute my plan. All right, that's it for me. 